I'm Rob Trosinski. This is Symposium, where we bring people together to have conversations about the nature of liberalism and a free society. My guest today is Jonathan Rauch, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and author of the new book, The Constitution of Knowledge. Thanks for coming on. Thanks. Great to be here, Rob. Uh, all right. So I, I'm fascinated by the, the premise of this book, The Constitution of Knowledge, because it's the idea that uh, you know, in this attempt, and we, we're, we're awash in misinformation today, and we're all very concerned about, you know, fake news and, and, and the use of fake news as an epithet to then promote even faker news. Uh, and uh, the attempt to try to ground our political debate in some kind of modicum of reason and persuasion and evidence. And so you write about the, un, what you sort of regard as an unwritten constitution that helps to keep our knowledge grounded in facts and reason. So just we could just explain to me the premise of the, of the book. The book actually has three premises and I'll name them for you, but since this is the first ethological place to start, premise one is it's not a marketplace of ideas, it's a constitution of knowledge. Premise two is you're being manipulated. And premise three is they're not 10 feet tall, we are. And the first one of those is, in fact, exactly what you said, that all societies have what you might think of as an epistemic constitution, which is a way they come to a common understanding in society about what's true for public purposes. And most of the ways most societies have done that is by using an authoritarian system. You know, a priest or a holy text or a prince will tell everyone what the belief is, and that's what people are supposed to believe. We have a revolutionary different way of doing it which started about 400 years ago. Um, it's the constitution of knowledge, I call it, but it's, it's, a, it's a liberal system. It's a system in which we have to persuade each other. And we do that through a whole bunch of settings and structures. And that's the constitution of knowledge. Basically, it's our system for keeping ourselves as a society in touch with reality. Now, I, I was fascinated by the way you, you did the analogy to, between knowledge and politics in a way, and I, I liked your analogy to Thomas Hobbes, because he's the one who wrote the idea that, you know, uh, without uh, the state, uh, the state of nature, it's a war of all against all, and therefore you need the authoritarian leader to come in and be the ultimate authority and, and impose that authority on everybody in order to have order. And then the Lockean approach comes along and says, no, we're not going to have an authoritarian we're going to have power you know, distributed to the people. And basically that's what you're saying is that instead of having knowledge being, you know, instead of having a, a, an epistemological Leviathan <laughs> who comes in and is the authority figure, we're going to distribute the production and checking and evaluation of knowledge, give power back to the people to do that in a, in a distributed and non-centralized way. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's a revolutionary idea, which is that you distribute the power to decide what's true and false throughout society. But also, as with the political constitution, everyone has to follow certain rules. So individual people are interchangeable. If you do something to test a proposition to find out if, if it's true or false, then in principle, I or anyone else should be able to do the same thing and get the same result. That's replicability. And we always need to be on the lookout for errors. The, the fundamental notion here is that we are such biased creatures, humans. We are so bad at perceiving our world. We make so many mistakes. And they're not just random mistakes, they're biased mistakes. So if left to our own devices, we wind up going down all kinds of epistemic rabbit holes of crazy beliefs, and cults and sects and weird stuff. So we have to constantly check each other. And that's the system that starts with the scientific revolution. Interestingly, it overlaps with the same people and the same ideas that created the political revolution of liberalism. So these things actually developed at the same time by many of the same people on parallel paths, and they're very closely intertwined. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that that, that overlap is that it's the same people because it's a lot of the same basic premises, like you know, the idea that all men are created equal and with equal rights is a political proposition, but it also has epistemological meaning, right? If all men are created equal, then we can all check each other. You know, there is no such thing as, as an intellectual authority. We can all check each other's work and we can all criticize each other. And we are epistemologically equal. Exactly. At least as a starting proposition, of course, we can become experts. We become right. professional specialists in our field. So we would rather have an MD 
uh, tell us, uh, diagnose us than you know the, the person down the block. But that's earned authority, and that comes with credibility. And those people have to be checked too. You know, they also have to get it right. And if they develop a consistent record of getting it wrong, well, then they'll be debunked. So one of the key things here, and one of the reasons that the constitution of knowledge has actually never been popular, is that anyone can be debunked at any time in principle, and people don't like that. <laughs> As a general rule, I've discovered that. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, now. The question here, though, is that um, you don't really throw out the idea of the marketplace of ideas as you don't throw that out idea out, but the idea of that the constitution of knowledge is sort of almost adding to that. Yeah, when I say it's it's not a marketplace of ideas, it's a constitution of knowledge. Here's why that's important. The, the subtitle of, of my book is A Defense of Truth. It's not a defense of free speech. Well, of course, I'm for free speech. I'm a tireless um, advocate of free speech. But, but free speech isn't enough because the idea of a marketplace of ideas assumes that, you know, you've got these kind of disembodied ideas and they go out there in the world and they somehow clash with each other and truth will emerge automatically. Um, but that's not how it happens, actually. What really happens is a very structured social process where we are forced to persuade each other so it's what it really is, is a marketplace of persuasion. As with the US constitution, if you wanna pass a law, there are things you're gonna to have to do. And there's no other way to pass a law. And it's highly structured. You have to work through institutions like Congress and the president, and they're going to be processes. Well, the marketplace of persuasion works in the same way. It's got lots of rules and lots of institutions. Um, developed over 400 years, very successful. But there are things like in, the, in journalism, there are newsrooms, which I came up in with lots of rules about double sourcing and making sure you, you try to check with people before you print things without them. In science, there are things like peer review, academic conferences, uh, journal publication, all kinds of means and systems that basically act as kind of filtering stations on the pathway to making knowledge. So you have, to, you have to go through these places to get your ideas checked before they transmit them to other places. So what you wind up with is, is a system that's very structured. And we miss that when we talk about the marketplace of ideas. And that makes us vulnerable because the attacks on the system are attacking those critical nodes, those institutions that actually do the hard work of comparing and contrasting the idea is figuring out which ones are better, which ones are worse, and then passing them along. That's what they're attacking. All right. The, 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 the main focus of the book, and I wrote down this phrase, I found it very interesting. It, it, you use the word liberalism's epistemic operating system. Now, here's for the benefit of people who don't have a background in academic philosophy. We're using epistemic and epistemology. It comes from the Greek word for knowledge, episteme. It basically means the study of what is knowledge, how do we gain it? And uh, the idea that liberalism has an epistemological foundation for it and a, a theory of what knowledge is and how we how we gain it. And uh, there's one in particular idea in here that uh, that you talk a lot about in your book uh, that uh, I, you know you you mentioned a number of times in the book that you know the system for getting knowledge is both competitive and cooperative. So in the, in that vein. Uh, I am both delighted and kind of ticked off that you uh, flesh out in the book an idea that I've been toying with for a long time. I call it epistemological Madisonianism. So you have a whole section on James Madison and, and, and has the father of the Constitution and, and the ideas he used to create the Constitution and the sort of epistemological meaning of that. And that's something I've thought about for a long time. So let me sort of explain the idea as I have it. And then I wanted you to give your version of it, which is I looked at James Madison's uh, Federalist Number Ten. That's the one where he explains the problem of factionalism, and the idea that you know if he, his argument was, you know, the, the old argument was you should have a small republic where everybody basically thinks the same and agrees the same. They all have the same interests to so have a lot more unity. And he said, no, that's the last thing you want. What you want is a large republic where you have a great diversity of prejudices and biases and economic interests. And therefore, you know, people who share a bias will be less likely to be able to combine together to invade the rights of other people, and they'll have to cooperate and form coalitions and persuade other people to get what they want. And I 
my view is, that, is was that this has an epistemological aspect, which is that you know if you're in a non-diverse community, a small community where everybody thinks the same, they're likely to share the same biases, the same prejudices, and the same sort of immediate economic interests. They're likely to sort of fall prey to groupthink and go go you know go off a cliff without questioning the basic ideas that they have. Whereas if you have a, a large diverse community, you can't rely on other people to share your biases and prejudices. So you're going to have to use evidence and reason, and you're being, going to force to find an objective way to ex explain your ideas and convince them. And I think you're very much making that same point in, in the book. Yeah, you, you put that well. Um, I'm glad I wrote the book before you had a chance to write it first, because we're we're clearly on the same path. I, I, so, have, I wrote an article where I mentioned this like a little bit years ago, and then I wish I'd published more, but th that's fine. That I, I'm delighted that you have taken this and flushed it out. But go on. Well, it, it's, a, it's a deep and important idea. I think that Madison is possibly the single greatest political thinker. And the reason for that is he had the most extraordinary political insight maybe of all time, not by himself, he built on others, but he really brought it to a fine point and then institutionalized it. And Madison understands that in any political world, ambition is going to be a threat. You're gonna have people who will want to impose their will on other people. Well, how do you deal with that? Libertarians could just say you don't allow coercion, but of course that begs the question of how you prevent that. Well, then you could have laws that say, well, you can't coerce other people. Well, who will enforce those laws? If you get a sociopath or demagogue in charge of the government, the laws won't be enforced. Madison has this amazing insight. The way you counteract ambition is by counterposing it against other ambition. Ambition is the only force that's strong enough to contain ambition. So he sets up the system where in order to get everything, anything done, ambitious people have to compromise with other ambitious people, whether they want to or not. And that's what the constitution is fundamentally. It's a system for forcing compromise and making it impossible for people to do things outside of compromise. Well, the same applies to the parallel system of knowledge that we have substitute for persuasion for compromise, but the only way to get something into the canons of knowledge, you know, into the textbooks, for example, is for people who are ambitious that their ideas succeed to persuade other people who are equally ambitious, but different. And now we get to the point that Rob Trusinski so beautifully makes, which is to make that work, you need diversity. You need enough bias so that everyone's bias will be countered by someone else's bias. As individuals, we cannot spot our own bias. This has been found by psychology again and again. We all think we're right. We think we're unbiased and everyone else is biased. These things are invisible to us. And the only way we find them is by being forced, whether we like to or not, to compare our biases with other people's biases and many others. That will generate reality. Well, that's the system the constitution of knowledge sets in place. It's a massive global infrastructure with now hundreds of millions of mind, people comparing their biases with each other. That's where objectivity comes from. And yeah, it's got to be pluralistic. It's got to have lots of points of view. So it's Madison. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Um, so the, and you also mentioned, you know, you put James Madison along with John Locke and Adam Smith as sort of the, I think the three main founders of the system and specifically with the idea of the, especially with Adam Smith, the idea that things can be done in a decentralized way through a, di a diversity of different people with different interests, but with rules that, you know, set those interests into some sort of coordination with each other. Yeah, Smith is right there too, because he understands that if you get the incentives right, you can take antisocial impulses like greed and self-interest and harness them in a way that will produce outcomes that are pro-social, which is again, very similar to Madison. They're contemporaries, of course, they're working at the same time. Um, they both have a debt to the Scottish Enlightenment. Um, Smith applies these ideas primarily to the world of economics, but it turns out they apply in politics and um, epistemic, the, the world of knowledge as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so you have a, 
I said an interesting example there about Vulcanists versus Neptunians, which is a, yeah. a I, I'd heard about it before. It's it's, a, it's an obscure little corner of of scientific history where there were people who early geologists and there's there was one school that thought uh, it was vul volcanic activity was the main thing that caused geological change, and the other said water was the main thing. Those those were the Vulcanists and the Neptunians, and they had knockdown drag out battles. And and you write a little bit. I thought it fascinating little vignette as how that was how that was settled. How how we they got beyond those bitter conflicts. So, uh, do you want me to tell that story? It's a it's it's a fun story, but it yeah, takes yeah. a minute or two. Take a minute or two is fine. I um, think it's good to have the details of this. Well, the reason it takes a minute or two is I just want to roll the tape back to a little bit before that. And and someone who's listening to this, you know, erudite conversation up here in Cloud Cuckoo Land may wonder why does all this matter. You know, we're talking theory right now. Well, well, here's why it matters. The traditional way of settling differences of opinion about important public facts is warfare. It can be hot warfare where one side just kills off the other side. That's like the religious wars of the 16th century when, you know, po possibly 30% of the population of Germany was killed in wars between Protestants and Catholics and among Protestants. We see this again and again. The other way to settle it is Basically, someone wins, imposes their will on the other side, and imposes a regime of censorship and, and repression. Um, and this happened again and again through history. Science comes along, science broadly defined, comes along as a way to force people to reach some kind of sense of consensus peacefully. So now we flip to the dispute that you're talking about. It's the late 1700s. And there's a dispute over the origin of the earth. Was the origin of the earth in floods? Noah's flood, earth opens up, releases huge amounts of water and mountains and valleys and oceans are as a result of that. Or is the earth made primarily by volcanic activity? Um, well, in the late 1700s, people didn't have a way to settle that. So they essentially went to war. They divided into competing sects, Neptunians versus Vulcanists, and the, the controversy became so heated that at a play of uh, play stage by Vulcanists, Neptunians came and, and basically they deplatformed it. They basically shouted stuff and, and made it shut down. This is how hot under the collar it got. So along comes a younger generation and say, let's not settle it that way. Let's all get off our high horses theorizing. Let's go out in the world and look for facts. We'll look for fossils. We'll do stratigraphy. Um, we'll just, we will focus on looking at observable things where we're forced to compare notes over where did this fossil, where did that fossil come from? They substitute empiricism for warfare. This is Locke's great insight. Empiricism forces people to go out and check with other people. And within about a generation, they solve the problem. In fact, they bypass it completely. Um, and they develop the consensus that we now have today. The Vulcanists were more right than the Neptunians. Uh, both turned out to be wrong because they didn't know about glaciation. But over the course of about 30 or 40 years of changing the rules and saying, no, you have to go out and look, and then you have to develop some kind of consensus according to decentralized rules, they found in modern geology. That makes it possible to have the long time scales that we have today, which is what makes it possible to have not only geology, but cosmology, biology, evolution. That's the foundation of modern science. And it all happens because some people go to war and have to solve the social problem. Now that let's talk about social, the social problem uh, is interesting because you talk about, you put a lot of emphasis on the idea of building systems and building communities of knowledge where knowledge isn't just you know, one person saying, as the authority saying, here's what it is, but you have a whole community of people who are working with each other and trading ideas and checking each other's ideas. Yeah, I call it the reality-based community with apologies to Karl Rove, who <laughs> originated the concept in a very different context. Yeah, reality is not what's in our head, any one of us. It's not even in what's in the head of any particular group of us. It's what's generated by this massive global network of people checking each other's work, hunting for each other's errors, working through these intermediaries like all these institutions like universities and newsrooms and publications. Um, 
Uh, and it includes not only classic knowledge seekers like academics, but it also includes the media. It includes law, which is fundamentally reality oriented. You have to present ideas in court. They have to pass muster. They're going to be tested by contrary ideas. It's also true in government, um, which is also reality based or should be when it's when it's working. So the my, reality, the, the viewers can't see this, but my eyebrows went up when you said <laughs> talked about government being reality yeah, based. But yeah. that, that's that's my bias that's, coming in. We'll we'll get to that part of the conversation. Uh, the reality based community is basically what we outsource our version of reality to. We say, I don't know for sure. You don't know for sure. We're both afflicted by biases, but we've got this large community. It's the original and greatest of all human social networks, and it produces the three most important things we rely on: truth, which is knowledge. Freedom, which is the ability to make up our minds without coercion, and especially peace, which is it can settle disputes about facts without going to war. Now, when you write about this, I, I found that you emphasize the sort of communal nature or the or society. Uh, well, actually, first let me talk about one other thing, which is when you talk about. Now, here's my eyebrow going up. Uh, and I know that when you talk about like the media being the reality based community, there's a whole group of people who will really sort of like spit out their coffee at that. Uh, because there is this problem of, of, I mean, a real problem of press bias. We, we saw a recent thing where uh, 60 Minutes did his piece on, on uh, Florida government, Governor Ron DeSantis, where they, so, uh, the argument is that they selectively edited his answer on a, a question about his dealing with the pandemic uh, in order to make him look bad. So there's a, there's a lot of, you know, there's a whole cottage industry, I know, on the right of pointing to examples of press bias. So, it does this system of having a reality-based community in theory, how does it work in practice? What are the imperfections? And, and, and how does it work better than anything else? Well, for sure it works better than anything else because the alternatives lead straight to warfare and repression. And for sure it has its flaws. And this gets to the second half of my book, which you know lays out the, the airy stuff about where knowledge comes from and building the reality-based network and and all of those things. But this gets us to the second half of the conversation, which is attacks on that system, flaws in that system, things that need to be fixed. And one of those is when one of these reality-based systems doesn't have enough diversity of viewpoint, then you get into situations where we get in echo chambers. So we think we're checking with, with other people to make sure we're right. But in fact, we're just hearing ourselves talk back because we all agree on who we're talking to. And those bubbles occur if you don't have enough diversity of viewpoint. Science, liberal science, big science, um, in, including, I'd argue, reality-based professions like journalism and like law. As Madison said, they need a lot of diversity. They need pluralism to function. And a lot of the flaws that people don't like about media happen when there's not enough viewpoints that are represented. That said, what mainstream media is good at is although you're going to see bias in particular sources and you're going to see bad stories, and that's how it works. Because remember, the great virtue of the reality-based community is not that it doesn't make mistakes. It's that it makes so many mistakes so quickly, but it also works through them quickly. Um, so the question is, do these mistakes continue over time or are they corrected by others in the system? And usually they tend to be corrected in mainstream media. Um, not all media works that way. It turns out conservative media increasingly work differently. They're amplifying these errors over time instead of correcting them. But yeah, that said, a, an important problem right now is to make sure there is enough viewpoint diversity meaning, for example, enough conservatives in newsrooms so that everyone's bias gets properly checked. And that does not always happen. Yeah. So on the one hand, the conservative critiques of the mainstream media do serve that function of being the check and of, of drawing attention to things that are inaccurate or, or distorted. At the same time, the way it's actually used in practice often means don't listen to that other person's biased media, listen to our biased media instead. Yeah, there's some Really interesting work by Yochai Benkler and his group at Harvard. And they've mapped networks of information through the media using millions and millions of data points. And they actually find that conservative media and non-conservative media, well, they find that there's 
there's not left media and right media, there's right wing media and the rest. And that they behave on different epistemic models. It's not just a difference in political viewpoint, but if you take a conspiracy theory, um, even one that liberals would tend to want to believe, and you drop it into mainstream media, it'll tend to die out over a couple of news cycles because other people will look at it, they'll test it, it'll tend not to check out. So it'll tend to kind of, it'll tend to fizzle. The, the opposite tends to happen when you drop a conspiracy theory on right-wing media, on conservative media, they find it tends to propagate. It actually tends to get amplified because their model seems to have more to do with bias confirmation than bias disconfirmation. So that's worrisome because that means that those organs are not functioning as part of the reality-based community to the extent that that's going on. They're spinning off into a different epistemic world and that becomes a worry. So I, I think perhaps part of explaining it in terms of viewpoint diversity, that the mainstream media has that diversity of viewpoints from sort of the far left to the center right. Uh, and even though it's missing some of that diversity, that's still more diversity than so, like, if you go to Newsmax or OANN, where it's basically, you know, one, there's only one viewpoint represented and no, nothing else is welcome. So it becomes yeah. a very non-diverse. Uh, yeah, that's right. Though, though one of the interesting findings that Benkler and his group have come up with is that there kind of isn't a center right on media anymore. And that's a, that mm -hmm. is a huge blind spot, actually, in our politics, because the center right is, is such a crucial point of view. Uh, it's, I think it's basically where I come from these days. And, and there isn't, there's a big shortage of center right media because of the giant sucking sound of genuine right wing media, uh, which has attracted so much money and such a large viewership. Yeah, I've seen that. Um, now, in, in talking about this idea of having a system or a constitution of liberty, you put a lot of emphasis on the idea of its, its communal nature and of the, the knowledge as being a social product. And I, I, it set me on edge a little bit because I think you know there are two ways of saying that knowledge is social or that it's, it's developed by a community. And one is to say that it is objective, that it's something that's independent of any one particular person's opinions or biases, but where everyone's forced to go outside of their individual uh, observations and verify them independently uh, with observation of the facts made by others. But I was a little leery of the idea of talking about knowledge as being social because and I know you know this, that there's a whole sort of politically correct view on the right, oh, sorry, on the left, which holds that knowledge is quote unquote socially constructed. And that's a lot of what's pushing the sort of um, uh, wokeness and political correct, it, it, back what we used to call political correctness back in the 80s and 90s and what we call wokeness now, which is this idea that, and that's why they're so concerned about, for example, policing the words people use. Because the idea is if knowledge, if, if knowledge and reality is socially constructed, then you just get people to use the right words and stop them from using the wrong words. And reality itself will fall into line with your, you know, it's the best way to make reality fit your biases is you just change the words everybody uses and knowledge will, reality will be socially constructed in the way you want. So that's why I'm sort of concerned about the idea, this formulation of, knowledge being developed socially. I can't resist pointing out, Rob, that um, I don't think you noticed this, but you used the phrase constitution of liberty in reference to my book. Oh, <laughs> and, yeah, constitution of knowledge. And, and I like that because I, I took the title from Hayek and am and, and, and inspired by Hayek's thinking and, and writing this book. So, so that's sweet for me. We, we just talked to somebody um, from the libertarian right. We've got this, I've got this sort of plugged into my, into my subconscious. <laughs> so, um, so here's the way I try to think about, about the point you're making, which is, is this, is this idea that knowledge is a social creation? Is that a dangerous left-wing idea? Well, no, because it's a true idea. It's how knowledge is a, a product of a social system. Where the left goes wrong, I think, or where certain, certain, parts of the left go wrong is by saying, well, if all there are social systems, then all social systems are created equal. And in fact, some social systems are better because they favor people like us or certain minorities or whatever. So it's just a power game. That's all we care about. And to me, that's like saying, well, no one rules simply by inherent authority and all political systems are inherently 
political. So it doesn't matter if you have a democracy or a totalitarian dictatorship. It's all power all the way down. Who cares? Let's go with the dictatorship. I'll be in charge. Now, hang on a minute. There's a non sequitur there. There are a lot of different social systems and they have very different implications. So a society built on knowledge made by a few privileged people who are in a position to silence, exile, or kill the others is a very different kind of society than one where people are forced to compare and contest their views to persuade each other in rational and organized ways. They're completely different societies. A big chunk of the second half of the book is an analysis of, of what goes wrong in communities where you get a lot of social coercion to believe and say certain things. This is cancel culture, speech policing, uh, certain forms of political correctness, sometimes on campus, now often off campus. Um, and what this is about is not seeking truth. It's about organizing and manipulating the social environment for political advantage, otherwise known as propaganda. So a social system based on propaganda is a very different kind of information environment than one that's based on a decentralized search for knowledge. Uh, and that's the core distinction. I'm, I think what my book does is it takes the politics seriously. It says, okay, we're going to look at knowledge as a political system. We're going to figure out which political system is actually better. <laughs> Uh, you bring up cancel culture. That's, you know, I know that this is not something that is new, and I know that you know it's not new because all the way back in 1993, you wrote a book called Kindly Inquisitors, which is based about what we called at the time political correctness. Um, the terminology seems to have shifted. Um, what do you think is sort of new, though, about that that has made it, I, I think it's general agreement that in the last five years especially, that has become more intense what do you think that's new that has, was, has gone beyond what was going on on campuses in the, in the 90s? Well, you can go back way before the 90s. You can go back to Alexis de Tocqueville, who described what we would now call cancel culture in wonderful detail back in the 1830s. Um, what, cancel culture is a, a you know, contemporary slang for what I think of as coerced conformity. That's when you use social mechanisms to intimidate, intimidate isolate, demoralize and deplatform people of a certain point of view that's disfavored. And lots of societies have done that down through history. It's a standard way to regulate what people think. You know, if you think the wrong thing, you're thrown out of polite society. No one will hire you. No one will befriend you. The difference now is not that the methods are new. It's that you have systems for coming down so quickly and so harshly on dissenters by using social media and other forms of instant social organization that can, I mean, you know, you could, you could send out a tweet that people don't like this happened to someone, get on an airplane, on an overnight flight, get off 10 hours later, and you're a global pariah, your job is gone, your career is gone, no one will talk to you or associate with you. That couldn't happen before. So the consequences become a lot more extreme. The other thing that's happened is we kind of turbocharge these doctrines by adding the notion of emotional safety, mm. which is that if you say something that's offensive or bigoted or wrongheaded. And of course, in a system that's all about seeking errors, people are going to make mistakes like that for all kinds of reasons. Um, but if you say something like that, if you make that kind of mistake, you're committing, you're, you're endangering people, you're committing an act of, of violence, literal violence, not, not figurative violence, but literal violence. And that means that making mistakes becomes a human rights violation. So you get this notion that it's, it's not only that people are being canceled, um, uh, silenced because they're offensive, but that saying and believing certain things is inherently a form of violence. And when you combine those two things, you get a combination that comes down on people very, very hard. Yeah, I, I noticed that social media, it's that the participants become increasingly more obscure so that, you know, it, it, that some totally unknown person can say something and a whole bunch of other totally unknown person, unrelated to that person across the world can react to it. And that's not something that would have happened in, in the pre-internet, pre-social media era where the people reacting to you would have been people around you who know you and yeah. you have some pre-existing pre relationship that's more likely to, to cause them to act, to, to, to take into account a, a wider context. Um, 
but the the other part is that uh, this idea of speech as violence, because you know, if the whole purpose of this, as you put it, is to to achieve a peaceful resolution, is to uh, achieve consensus or achieve agreement without violence. If all disagreement is violence to begin with, then the whole you know it, it's impossible that the, this whole this, the whole attempt to try to do things without violence becomes impossible. Yeah, you subvert the whole system because, as we've been saying in a lot of a lot of very different ways, the the genius of the constitution of knowledge is not that it doesn't make mistakes; it's that it makes mistakes so quickly. And the reason it can make mistakes quickly is that we pub we punish the hypothesis, not the person. So in the old Soviet Union, if you got the wrong answer in biology, the one that was not approved by the state, your hypothesis was debunked and the process was you were taken out and shot. This is a big disincentive to thinking creatively and making mistakes. And it leads almost immediately to still stultification, the loss of knowledge, the loss of, of truth, the loss of, of everything. You've got to have a system in which people are free to make mistakes and in which you punish the mistakes, but you don't necessarily punish the person unless they've committed an act of fraud, for example, or some serious professional oversight. If they're just wrong about something, the way we deal with that is they lose the argument. The argument continues, they lose it. They are free to re-enter the game with a better idea. Over time, if all they have is screwball ideas over their career, we'll know that and they'll be marginalized. Because you know, over time, you've got to have a track record. But if you have a system where one mistake and you're out for life, people are going to be terrified to have new ideas. And, and guess who predicted the result of that back in 1859? Our old friend John Stuart Mill in On Liberty. He says that you cannot have a free society if you can't have what he called eccentricity and what I think today we would call unorthodoxy or dissent. You've got to have a society where people feel they can have a lot of different viewpoints. Right. And, and the Soviet example shows that when you have that kind of fear and, and suppression, that what you actually get is a very fragile system where everybody seems to agree, you know, 99% agreement on everything on the outside. And most people actually disagree uh, uh, underneath. And I think that leads me to, to something about the, the current moment of, you know, we, we talk about cancel culture and, and wokeness and people being afraid to speak. But I also see that as a similar kind of fragile consensus that, um, as, as you mentioned, that, you know, the, the big one of the things that's changed recently is you, you hear, you know, center left people or, or liberals in the traditional American sense of being center left that they're as intimidated by this as people on the right. And there's sort of a growing pushback and efforts like, like what I'm doing with Symposium to try to get sort of center left and center right people or reasonable people on both sides across the spectrum to get together in favor of a, a, a liberal outlook and that, that broader sense of you know, greater diversity of opinion, greater freedom of opinion. Yeah, yeah, pluralism is is just really what it's all about. And there have always been forces. This is not new, Rob. As you know, pluralism, liberalism have been controversial since day one. And there are a lot of reasons that they always will be controversial. I, I tell people whenever I speak on free speech that the that, that free speech is the most counterintuitive social idea of all time. The notion that um, that speech and expression, which is wrongheaded, bigoted, obnoxious, heretical, blasphemous, add to the list, that speech like that should not only be allowed, but protected, is the craziest sounding idea that there ever was, social idea that there ever was, bar none. And it's redeemed only by the single fact that it's also the single most successful social idea that there ever was, bar none. But this means that people like me and maybe you and your kids and grandkids and their grandkids will have to get up every morning for the rest of their lives and explain this principle from scratch. And we just we have to do that cheerfully. Um, yeah. And we're doing amazingly well. Well, and I want to end on something I, I really liked about your book, because I, I've read some other books that make very similar points. But we'll talk about how, you know, bias is natural and irrationality is unnatural. And I think you push more in the direction of saying that, well, wait a minute, the actual evidence shows that, you know, the counteracting the natural that, you know, if tribalism, yes, tribe bias and tribalism and epistemic tribalism is natural 
but rationality and the system we've created is equally natural that it, it's and we can see that by the fact that we actually have built this system and maintained it and that gives us sort of grounds for optimism that this can be continued and defended well that's point three of the big three that i that i raised so thank you for getting there which is um they're not 10 feet tall we are right now it feels like uh, we're overwhelmed with social media, with its, its incentives to behave badly toward each other, to propagate falsehoods, to get attention, to troll each other. We feel like we're overwhelmed with disinformation tactics, which have been now tried and true for 100 years, perfected by people like Lenin and Goebbels, but now applied in the United States in ways that we've never seen before, the so-called fire hose of falsehood. Uh, the Trump practice, where you just put out so much bullshit at such a quantity that people become confused and disoriented, opens the door to demagoguery. We feel overwhelmed by certain kinds of cancel culture, like how can you ever talk to so many university professors who are, who are um, in dissent, but they have no way of connecting with each other. They feel isolated and demoralized. How can we ever push back? And I remind people, the system we have that, that makes knowledge it's a global system, it's millions of minds, it's fantastically dense in its institutional networks. Think about thousands of universities, thousands of newsrooms, of law courts, of journals, um, the, the conferences, um, the, the professional societies, the trade groups, all of these are embedding knowledges and practices. They have all come under challenge again and again over two or 300 years. This is not the first huge information disruption we've had. The inventing of the printing press was an even bigger one. And it takes time to adapt, but there's also tremendous strength and adaptability in these organizations. And the, the trick for us right now is to figure out how to adapt the constitution of knowledge to these new challenges. And the book is full of ideas about how to do that, but I think it's happening already. Now, it's, it's not that the good guys, quote unquote, automatically win. It's always touch and go. It's just always a race between the constitution of knowledge and its enemies. But don't underestimate the incredible strength that this system has if we understand the nature of the challenges and respond. And I think that's happening. I absolutely agree. And I, I, I'm dedicated to doing my part for it. And uh, I really appreciate you doing your part for it by, by putting out these ideas. Uh, my guest today has been Jonathan Rausch, who is the uh, author of, and not the author of The Constitution of Liberty, but author <laughs> of The Constitution of Knowledge. Uh, a defense An almost of equally great book. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thanks. I really appreciate your coming on to, to talk about this. Well, thank you. And I can I, before we sure. end, I want to shout out Symposium, which is a textbook model of how you structure another node in the reality-based network so that people can be of different views can be brought together and 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 brought into some kind of um, some kind of consensus that advances knowledge. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. I'm Rob Trusinski with Symposium Magazine. You can follow the podcast or follow the videos on our videos on YouTube. And you can always uh, find more ideas and information and longer articles at symposium.substack.com. Thank you for joining the conversation.